I have found that there are a few really, really sad moments in life, even more sad than your computer battery running dead, Terry, so don't worry about that. Moments that seem like the world is just, everything is just going poorly. Moments of deep, deep uh, disappointment, maybe even humiliation. Uh, and and it, can, it can happen really in just an, an instant in our lives. So maybe you had one of these instances in your life. Can you remember when this happened to you? When you, you were at maybe, uh, you might have been at an amusement park, you might have been at a fair, uh, and they had all these wonderful things to ride and have fun on, but they had that little sign, you must be this tall, right, to ride this ride. And, you know, I've seen it before, and maybe you've experienced it. You just see the little children, you know, they go to stand under, they stand under it, and they don't measure up, and the, the, just the sadness and even tears begin to fall because you weren't, you know, tall enough. Your age didn't give you the, the height to be able to, uh, to ride the ride of life, to be amused. So I don't know about you, but I don't like being... Uh, told that my age eliminates me from parts of life. I'd like to be able to do whatever I want to do. But I suppose even I practice some age discrimination because I, I sort of, I, I have some particular judgments that, that come under the umbrella of, of age because I value uh, greatly, I value wisdom and the maturity of thought that that, that can produce in our lives, that's kind of important to me, and so I put a value on that. What, though, is the age of respect? What's the age of respect for people? And I think everyone in here, if I were to ask you that and poll and get the answer, I think you, we all come at that a little, a little differently in different ways. In our modern culture, you know where we live today, uh, sometimes we give children too much power. We respect them too much beyond the wisdom of their years. You know, we'll poll little children. I've, you see this every presidential election. We'll poll little kids that don't have a clue about the news and politics and say, who do you want to vote for president? And they'll, they'll announce the results of the poll. Well, here's what Markham Middle School, who they voted for president. It happens all the time. Or should we, uh, you're asking, asking teenagers if you should legalize drugs, probably not the wisest thing. You may not get the answer that you want, but we do it. We will do that. But still, other times, we give children too little respect, don't we? Children should be seen and not, at least we used to say that. I, I remember a story uh, Elisa used to tell about, she still tells it sometimes, about her mom. They were on this camping trip, and it was in the middle of this, they, they went out camping, and a hurricane came, and, but they were still camping, and it was flooding and raining, and she got really, really, really sick, and she kept complaining to her mother, complaining, she said, I don't feel good, I'm sick, and her mother says, ah, oh, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. They just thought she wanted to go home because it was raining, and turns out she was real, I forget what the thing was, she's not here at this service, but I'll find out next, next service. She was really sick, but because, you know, it's just a kid, just a kid. You know, there are children, there are churches, too, that uh, don't allow any, uh, any children in the worship. You know, they, they, they cart all the children out on purpose. You have no choice because adults are bothered by the squirming and the noise and all that. I think we're living in a bit of an age of uh, age confusion, and it's puzzling. It puzzles us to the point of, uh, I guess, it seems like there's no particular age that satisfies us. Isn't it interesting? When we're young, we long to be old. And when we're older, we long for those days when we were young again. You know, there's those giant milestones. They're great, aren't they? Uh, that giant step from 12 to 13. And because you know you receive that magic title of what? Teenager. We can't wait to be teenagers. And then there's the magic age of the driver's license. What's that? 16. That, man, it's incredible. Or the age of 18, the age of majority. 
or the age, the magic age of 65. And that's what I was talking with the kids about in the message, where you get to supposedly retire and sail off into those golden years. We spend most of our lives, don't we, anticipating milestones. But then when we enter into the twilight years, like I said, oh, we love to turn the clock back to feel the excitement and the energy of adventure once again. You know, there's one other great irony that has to do with age. It's those living at the extremes of age, uh, that spectrum. Th- those extreme spectrums, uh, age spectrum, are often treated uh, identically. If you're very young, sometimes you don't get much respect or treated well or included. And if you're very old, sometimes you don't get much respect or you're included. You know, it's, it's like both of those extremes get the sign, the little sign that says, your age will restrict you from life. You're too young or you're too old. We undervalue. We overvalue based on age. We either time in, we time out, or run out of time. So what does God have to say about it? Today, uh, we're, we're, you know, we're talking about connecting uh, the content of our lives. So obviously, we're going to begin to talk about, about age and what God has to say. Is God a respecter of age? Wonderful question. Does God love us? view us, sort us out by age. In this series, we've been trying to take all the bits and pieces, wonderful song, Terry, about God can take our broken pieces, and we've represented that. Uh, we, We took the hanging signs down, but as we've been working through these different aspects of our lives, the content of our lives, we've been trying to show how we can connect them up to God. So you see the signs have disappeared from hanging in the ceiling, scattered, and they've been brought into and placed on the cross. So we're going to continue that today by looking at the content of our lives, the part that has to do with age. So here's the question. Is age unfair? What do you say? Yes? No? I see several different responses out there. It seems that every age we struggle with I think our identity, it doesn't matter if you're young, middle, older, we, whatever age we are, we we can find uh, it hard to fit in, find the place that we belong. And there's one universal issue that has absolutely no age limits, and it's this, it's faith in and service to God. You ever think about that? When we look at God's activity in the world, there seems to be an intergenerational track record. That means no age limits, no signs saying you must be this old or this tall. God places incredible, and somebody said it, one of the children read my sermon notes already, or they read the blog, I don't know, because I forecasted some of this in my blog, but God places great value on those young in years. Think about this, he called David when he was just a boy. He, he might have only been 12 years old, we're not quite sure, it just says he was very young. He called him to face a giant. God places great value on those in the middle years, I guess, I'm kind of there, maybe hedging toward the older, but he called uh, Joseph and all the disciples while they were living in kind of those middle years, his team. They weren't really young and they weren't really old. They're right in the middle. And God places great value on those living in what we call the golden years. The Bible talks about it as old age. Think about this. This is amazing. When God called Abraham to start his journey, do you know how old he was? 75 years old, the Bible says. How'd you like to start, start out in life, really, leaving everything at the age of 75? Uh, How about this one? This uh, This is another good one. Moses. We know all about Moses, and we watched a cartoon of Moses, you know, in Pharaoh's court and all of those things. But do you know how old Moses was when God called him? Pretty old. (laughs) He said pretty old. I don't have that written down here, but he was 80 years old. That's when he went to face off with Pharaoh, 80 years old. Now, if you're thinking, ah, 75, 80, I don't know if I could do that. 
Maybe, maybe, I know we have some people in this church that, that, are, that are pushing way, way up into the mid-90s. It's wonderful. They're, uh, they're still here worshiping with us. For those that are pushing way up, do you know how old Noah was when he started to build the ark? Began to build the ark. The Bible says he was 500 years old. How'd you like that one? Start chopping trees at 500. That's a little tough, isn't it? You know, the Apostle Paul, he writes, in Christ there's no Jew, no Greek, no slave, no master. And I guess we could add, I think very confidently add, there's no young or old. Each age is uh, designated equally in a share of the kingdom of God, equally loved, equally uh, valued, and given an opportunity to serve. So I want to do, for the remainder of the message today, I would like to break up and look at three segments. Uh, segment. I'm making up words today. It's the Holy Spirit. Uh, <laughs> segments of age. Uh, and I would I'd like to talk about those. Uh, there's lots of different, we could divide up age any way we want, but you only have so much time to listen to me today. So it's three segments today. First segment is those just getting started out, the young, they're, they're starting to grow strong. They're prepping for the race, the young people. What does God think about the ones that are just starting out? It's interesting. God's word says don't, don't undervalue the ability and worth of young people. Samuel was called by God's voice, it says, when he was very young. I mean, we don't know what that means eight years old, six years old. It just said he was very young. Jeremiah says when he was a youth. And here's what happened. Jeremiah gets called, and he goes, oh, I'm just a little kid. I couldn't possibly, I can't speak to anybody. I, I can't do it. God says, that's not a good reason to me. God says, that's not a reason for me. I can use you. I can send even somebody very young, just like you. Look at, uh, I want to look at 1 Samuel 17, 33, and I hope that might appear for me on the screen. Great. 1 Samuel 17, 33. Even a 12-year-old boy can defeat a giant. I alluded to this. Listen to this. Then Saul said to David, you're not able to go against the Philistine to fight. He's too big. You got to be this tall to fight the giant. And David's not. You're just a boy. Hey, this guy's been a warrior since his youth. David's just a boy. And he stood up. And guess what? David won. He won for God. Amazing. And, and it's not just the Old Testament. What did Jesus have to say about being young? Jesus said, wow, being little. Remember what I said to the little ones if they're still in the room today, if they haven't gone out? When I said Jesus thought they were they were of greatest value. He, he saw being young, being a child, not something to grow out of. Isn't that wonderful? Jesus didn't think we're supposed to grow out of being childlike. It wasn't a useless time that you just got to move through. He saw great value. And again, Matthew 18, just real quick, it says this. At the time, the disciples came to Jesus and they asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Of all the people Jesus could have chose, he finds a little child, a little child, and he sets that little child right there among all those adults. And he goes, this is it. This, this person, this is the greatest. If you want to enter into the kingdom of heaven, here's the model. Here's who you need to, to be like. Amazing, amazing. So if you're gonna, if you're young, if you're in here and you're very young, uh, whatever that might mean, if you're very young today, God needs you. It doesn't mean you're not ready yet. He can use you right now. He's picking his team. I remember being picked up for teams in my neighborhood when I was little. I don't know if we still do that, where you get two captains and you pick up teams, and you know that the ones that get picked first are the ones everybody really wants, and if you're the last, I was almost always the last. If you get picked last, you're the one nobody wants. Jesus says, I'm going to pick the little ones first. They're the first ones I'm choosing. 1 Timothy 4.12. 
So it says, don't let anybody think less of you. Here's the lesson of you're young in here today. Don't let anybody think less of you because you're young. Be an example to all believers in what you say, the way you live, the way you love, your faith, your purity. In other words, little children can teach us a lot, and they do have a responsibility too. So there's the first segment. Here's the second segment of age. Those in the middle years. I'm probably at the tail end of that, but I'm kind of there, okay? In those middle years, those are the ones I, I consider they're running the race. They're keeping up. They're keeping the pace. You know, when you're in your middle years, it's interesting. You just seem caught. You're not young. You're not old. You're caught in that middle time. And the best word I could think about it when I was considering the passage, these, all of this, this connecting age, was... It's the rat race years, isn't it? When you're in the middle years, it's the rat race years. Too old not to work. I mean, too, too, uh, too uh, young not to uh, retire. Too, too old not to work. Did I say that right? I think you know what I mean. Let me say it again. You're, you're, you're not ready to retire yet. But you got to keep going. You're not so young that you don't really have to take responsibility and pay bills. It's amazing. You know, it, it's, it's uh, so what does it mean? What does it mean to run the race, this middle year race that's set out before us? Scripture talks about this race set out before us. Here's the answer. Those of us in the middle years, we need to know that we're in a marathon. We're in the marathon years. A marathon, you know, is a strenuous test of fitness, of uh, endurance, uh, and there's th that race set out before us. It requires faith. It requires stamina. It requires great commitment and discipline in order to live it out, to live faithfully. And it's almost as if Paul is thinking about us, uh, those that, that find themselves in those middle years, the middle part of life, when he speaks in Philippians 3, 12 through 14, he says this, that, that shows great. Not that I have already obtained this or already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing, one thing I don't forget. I don't want to forget what lies behind, but I want to strain forward to what lies behind. Ahead. I think there's one more screen. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. In other words, he's saying, I know you're in a marathon. Those in the middle years, you're in a marathon. You're, you're, you're going crazy. You're, you're in the crazy stage of life. You're being tugged in every different direction. He says, hang in there. Persevere. Strive toward the goal. Our race is for Jesus Christ. Our race is for Christ. It's not a rat race. Our race isn't for rats. We race for Christ. So the, the, the encouragement I think Paul is saying here is work for that that's most important. If you're in those middle years, work for that that's most important. If it's not important to God, maybe it's not very important. I, I'm not going to read it to you, but 1 Corinthians 9.25, it, it's a, it has a, a bit in there, some more encouragement. It basically says, don't go boxing in the air. You know, boxing in the air is Paul's, what he's talking about. Kind of just, you know, you're just fighting at these things. You don't even know what they are. Don't waste your time boxing in the air. Put your time toward the things that God thinks are important. So there's the middle segment. We didn't forget those at the, the third segment. Those that are finishing well, finishing well, leaning toward the goal. You know, age, I always said this already, age doesn't mean that someone's useless. The Bible says, listen to this, the Bible says age is a blessing from God. Now, for some of us who are in aches and pains, we might go, well, really? Yes. Listen to what the Proverbs say. There's Proverbs 20, 29. The glory of young men is in their strength. So, you know, yeah, Young men are strong, they can do a lot of stuff, young people, but the honor of old men is in their gray hair. I'm getting some, in their gray hair. Faith is an age restricted. You may grow into God as you're growing up, but you certainly can never grow out of him, even if you have gray hair. 
Samuel Ullman said this, nobody grows old merely by living a number of years. We grow old by deserting our ideals. Years may wrinkle the skin, but to give up enthusiasm wrinkles the soul. Wonderful quote. Growing old is not a disease. I've heard many say that. It's a privilege, and it's a privilege allowed by God. It's an opportunity, isn't it, to be, to be useful, productive for a bit longer in the service of the family of God. Seniors, now I'm talking to you. Technically, I think I am one because I'm over 55. But uh, seniors, here's what the Bible says. Here's what God says. Finish well. You can finish well by staying connected and being available. Joel chapter 1, two verses, two and three says this. Wise counsel to the younger is a duty of the aged. In other words, folks in their golden years, you have a duty to teach and to help those that, that are coming up behind you. We, we have this saying called the wisdom of the elders that's used quite often in Scripture. It, it, it means interaction with those that have lived long lives of faith. It's a key to raising up a family, a healthy community in Christ. Those that have gone before and have all these experiences, they have knowledge, gifts, all these things to help us. There are some in this church that have great money management skills and have done tutoring with some folks, uh, life lessons, administrative skills, all these things that you mastered, you can help pass those along. I, I remember some of the life lessons I, I learned from my dad. Uh, there was a real fun one that when I was little, my dad, uh, he let me drive the tractor you know, my dad had a cemetery, so we had these old tractors. They pulled wagons and things around to haul, haul dirt and whatnot. And I, even at a very young age, he let me ride the tractor. He showed me how to operate the throttle. And in those days, the throttle was a lever that you pushed up and down. It wasn't a pedal or something like that. And how excited I was to be able to drive the tractor. And uh, so I know he wanted me to have fun, but he was also teaching me something. The responsibility and how to operate big machinery. And the other thing that he passed on, and I've shared this before in here, is uh, my dad said something, and I've heard it, I've heard others say it. I don't know who actually uh, authored the quote, but it, he, my dad would say all the time, tell the truth. If you tell the truth, you never have to remember what you said. So I've remembered that forever. So wisdom of the elders. And, you know, I, I know that seniors... Um, everywhere in, in our church too, face some very uh, real issues in their life. But here's, here's the final, final bit of scripture. This won't appear on the screen. It's out of Galatians 6, 9. It says this, we basically never retire from God's service. And the passage says, keep, keep on. Keep on doing good for the Lord. Don't stop. Because at the end of it all, that's when we long to hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Keep doing something good for the Lord. Now, I'm going to close. And as I do this, I run the risk of offending. But I was often told that if we do not ever offend, we must not be preaching the gospel correctly. So here we go. I know there are churches out today. I call them age du jour churches. I, I quote, if you want to quote me, I made that up just yesterday. Age de jour churches. It's like everything today. E e everything, uh, even churches specialize, don't they? They specialize even in ages. There are churches that you'll go to and they're for nothing but people that are 70 and above. Some of them are right around us right now. Unfortunately, many Presbyterian churches today are like that. Many mainline churches. Then there's some churches that are for those folks in the middle, the workaday folks. And then there are other churches you can go to today, maybe tonight, probably maybe there was a Saturday night service, that, that are really focused just on the youth, on young people. So they kind of partition it off. And I guess that makes sense in, in some ways. But here's what makes greater sense, especially in light of all the scripture I just read you about how God honors all ages, and it's not a respecter of age, and it's this. We are striving in this church to be a church for all ages. 
a place where every single person that comes in the door can be valued and given an opportunity to serve. That's why our mission statement says, growing the faith of the whole family of God. That's what the whole family of God, part of it means. It means age too. Everyone is included. Everyone is worthy. Everyone is connected to God. We are never time restricted by God. We don't time out of God's calling on our lives. The content of our age is actually timeless in the kingdom of God.